All right, now that we hit the record button, I'm going to go ahead and start over. I'm George Castro. I'm going to be your host today for SIG on Prem. Um, we have two agenda items, a demo presentation, uh, Kubernetes via cargo using digital rebar on a hybrid cloud with Rob um, Hirschfeld and Greg Alpheus. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, we'll have you guys introduce yourselves in a minute. Um, and then we're going to talk about the state of federation on premise. Um, if anybody else has any issues, please go ahead and add it to the agenda. And I'm going to attempt to take notes, but I'm kind of struggling managing the Zoom as it is. So if people could just hop into the Google document and help us out, that would be great. I'll, I'll take notes. Okay, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, and with that, Rob and Greg, you guys want to introduce yourselves and we'll, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, Greg Altaus, I'm CTO at Racken. We shepherd a open source project called Digital Rebar. And that's what we're going to talk about today with regard to using it to deploy Kubernetes through Cargo and uh, on on-prem, but we also can do uh, cloud instances as well. So um, let me see if I can share my screen, give this a shot. Can everybody see? Okay, so uh, what uh, I'm going to show you is a uh, digital rebar. Kind of focus on the UI, but realize there's a CLI and a RESTful API that backs all this that you can actually do everything with. What I'm showing you here is our deployment view. It's a basically a collection of deployments on a set of nodes. And so in this case, I have two Kubernetes deployments and a system deployment. The system deployments where we use to discover systems. And then the other two, one's running a bunch of KVM instances, kind of simulating hardware. And the other is a GCE cloud running Kubernetes as well. So one of the things we've done is we provide a, um, digital rebar itself provides a provisioning environment. We can do bare metal uh, hardware discovery. We can do bias configurations, RAID configurations, then, um, lay down OSs and then provide that to the rest of the system as nodes that then can be consumed to deploy workloads. And in this case, the workloads are these deployments. Um, so like I have running on a KVM instance, a my Kubernetes deployment. Oh, well, assuming I have it not quite set up right because it's running on my desktop at home. Um, but in my cloud instance, oops, let me go back. How do I get Sorry, let me move that out of the way. Kind of floating there. Um, let's see, where is it? So here I'm running a GCE instance, running basically, let me type correctly. Yeah. Running our dashboard, right? Running cargo. Cargo has a set of things to do network validation, so I happen to be running that as well. Um, the idea is that we're using the upstream playbook directly. It's Ansible-based. Digital Rebar allows you to sequence and control all sorts of open source or your own private kind of what we call roles. In this case, um, we're running the Ansible playbook directly from Cargo. Um, there's other things we've been playing with, things like OpenStack uh, deployed through Helm on top of um, Kubernetes from the, um, there's a group, in fact, I think it, well, it was in the Slack for Kubernetes. I think they just got accepted into the OpenStack as an OpenStack project, so they're moving around. But the idea is that we're trying to provide an environment to run these items these open source projects um, across various platforms. So one of the things I want to show is um, a, I'm going to start another KVM instance. And what Digital Rebar provides is for an on-premise kind of setup is the ability to dynamically discover hardware, add it to the system, discover it, our case inventory it and then um, as the system comes along add them to the to an existing environment um, we like I said we mentioned we take advantage of cargo so we have nodes 
Um, and Cargo has a set of features that allow it to do adding nodes. It can also upgrade nodes. Um, we're in the process of, those are new features that have recently been added. Um, and so we're working to add those into workflows as well. So um, anyway, this is a, my KVM instance booting. Part of what we do is we build up an inventory of what that system is. In this case, since it's a KVM instance, we won't necessarily see as much in the way of like IPMI infrastructure, stuff like that. Um, as the system goes through its discovery process, uh, Digital Rebar will assign IP addresses. These can be admin interfaces. We do v4 and v6 addressing. We also do out-of-band management. So if an IPMI controller had been detected, that could be configured and enabled as well. With those in, set up and configured, the system can then be driven through the rest of the process. Um, what happens is the system pixie boots by default, or we expect systems to pixie boot. We give it an image called Sledgehammer that's basically a CentOS 7 RAM-only image. It goes through and does the discovery process. At this point, the node could have um, RAID controllers configured or discovered, could have a BIOS detected that needs to be set. Those can all be handled and injected as configuration to then get the node to a baseline state for then OS installation. Once the node is up, the node can then be added into a deployment. Oops, let me go over here. So at this point, I can move um, the node into my KVM deployment, and it will show up in here. And at this point, I can say I want to edit the deployment, and I can bind things to it. So at this point, I can say I want it to become a Kubernetes worker. So I'll add it to that. And the roles set up handling the dependencies. So for example, Kubernetes worker knows that it needs to have an OS installed. So that will then add that. At this point, I can commit it. The committing should cause it to take effect, or will cause it to take effect. And at this point, the KVM instance will reboot, go through an install cycle, uh, install a base OS. In this case, the OS is um, 1604, though it could be all sorts of other platforms. The environment allows us to keep track of um, what we call boot environments to make things available. Those can be things like local environments, our sledgehammer discovery image, we have various install options are available. The black ones indicate that the um, base image isn't available in this environment right now, though it could be added. Um, this also can be extended to include things like um, hardware validation images and things like that as well. And so you basically, normally what you would expect, you have normal boot parameters, um, templates that need to be built for each node, and then we have a templating system that lets you construct whatever you want for your boot environment, right? Um, this allows you to do things like software-defined RAID configurations and other things like that that aren't necessarily um, direct usage. Let's see. Um, additionally, oh, let's see, somebody chat. Um, got distracted there for a second. Um, anyway, that's kind of what's going on as the nodes go through. We also have what we call a provider concept. Um, what we've kind of talked about is the bare metal provider. Um, it's managing physical hardware, or KVM instances in this case. But we also have the ability to add a OpenStack provider, a Google provider, an Amazon provider, or a packet provider as a way to get nodes. And so as an example, I can go into a workload and say I want another Kubernetes instance, and this time I want it to be an Amazon. And so this is the idea of the hybrid part. We use the same set of control structures for all these environments so that they're consistent and um, applied uniformly. So in this case, then I can set my various parameters. I can change networking. All these are your basic um, parameters for cargo. Then we can choose layout, whether we want to be masters or workers and choose an HA or not. So I can choose an HA deployment, in this case, or both. Um, 
but we'll set that running. We get a JSON blob that represents this deployment so that we can save it, reuse it, inject it through um, the CLI. And then I can set this off and running and it will go out to my Amazon account, which is provided through the provider. The will create instances in Amazon and then start as those instances become up and available, we're provide those and then start running Kubernetes on them to make that available. Um, and you can see our deployment start to kick off and start to run. Let's see, um, what else? Let's see, Rob, anything? Let's see. What, what options are there for networks? So with regard to networking, um, within the providers, we in general take the default VPCs that are configured in the providers. For bare metal, it's much richer. We have the concepts of being able to define um, multiple networks. So for example, this is the admin network that we're running the KVM instances on. Right now, it's just a bare, v it's an untagged, unbridged, unbonded environment. Um, and then you can define a host address space, which is kind of static, and a DHCP ranges to hand out. Those are all options for the admin network. Additionally, you can add follow-on networks as well so that you can define, um, like I've got, a, I need to create a bonded pair with VLANs that need to be exposed to separate networks. Um, those can then be exposed and constructed additionally. We'll do things like grouping them so that we know that if it came from this admin network, it should probably pull from this group of public addresses as well. Those kind of concepts are all handled through the network administration part. Um, it's fairly rich. We have a conduit abstraction layer. So the idea is that instead of saying you want ETH0, we actually say you want like 10G1, which would be the second 10 gig interface that's detected on the system. That way you can handle bus enumeration problems as well as um, OS enumeration, right? Some OSs call them ETH0, some call them EMP5, S3, 4, right? That kind of stuff. That's the intent of the conduit abstraction. Um, and or part of bridge interfaces. Sorry. Uh, and or how do you, and you can define like bridged interfaces. Correct. So got, what you can got redundant switches and and use some kind of uh, um, not bridge but um, bonded. Correct. So we let you specify um, conduits. You can say like um, 10G0, 10G1, which would say take those two, create a bond, and then you can specify which mode of teaming you wish to define. Um, there's various views on, on, for example, in the bare metal space, the, uh, what's the Amazon space? Oops, let's go back. Um, some of the attributes we gather as part of the discovery image are things like um, LLDP information. Um, we try and gather port objects, which I can't show you through the UI right now, but the idea, and it's KVM, so there wouldn't be any data anyway. Um, the idea is that we gather LLDP information so that you can get a view of what switch ports things are connected to. Um, there's been long-term dreams for Rackin to add to digital rebar the ability to manage switches, but that's not, been a focus we find that within organizations a lot of times those are two separate groups that aren't necessarily communicating great so it's not been a high priority item for us but we have the data to be able to suggest things like lcp bonds and stuff like that now one of the other aspects that we try and deal with with regard to the deployments is the idea that you may wish to redeploy or you need to re uh, deploy nodes. So part of what we handle is lifecycle. So we have the ability to say rebuild this whole system. So force them through a reinstall or in the case of GCE reapply the um, systems um, or you can do it on a per node basis. So the idea is that you can um, force a node to um, reinstall itself back to what it was. Um, obviously that's dependent upon how you chose to set up HA and things like that. Um, in some cases, we can even add roles to the nodes to like drain them and then redeploy them. Um, those are features that you can add through adding additional roles. Right. It might be worth touching on the event, the, the concept of, a, of an event, to, of the event system and, and how you could use that to uh, so integrate. Digital Rebar also has behind itself an event system that it can set up 
then send events to itself internally. So a lot of these things are handled through events, but you can also set up listeners for them. Uh, one of the ways we have to do that is through what we call our rule engine. And um, that has the ability to specify things like, if you see this node come on line, you can then move it into this deployment or add this workload, or you can do things like if this system has 23 disks in it, then it's probably one of my storage nodes, so move it into the storage configuration and apply those kind of things. Um, we also have a profiles concept that allows us to take these attributes that nodes have and allow you to define the configuration versions of them and then build a cluster of, or build a collection of those attributes in a certain form and then apply those to the nodes uniformly um, as we well. Did I, we'd done a Kubernetes upgrade demo pattern that showed uh, Kubernetes upgrades where you could put the version number of Kubernetes in a profile and then apply that to blocks of nodes so you could do a controlled upgrade uh, within by injecting a, a configuration pattern from that perspective. So, um, What's powering the discovery that you mentioned? So the discovery system... We run a, well, so let me, two answers to that. One is um, our goal is for, have, for physical infrastructure to always pixie boot. The DHCP server that we run, um, we can use your existing one, but we also provide one as part of digital rebar that uh, tells the nodes to boot Sledgehammer on discovery and then keeps track of its, what its boot environment should be going forward. And eventually that becomes a local image right boot from local disks right mm -hmm. um and so that's how that's being managed um does that answer your question yeah i think so that's a custom mvp uh, uh, so it's basically it's just a it it is but it's all open source and the digital rebar directory has the kickstart um image builder that we use for it um and it's really just CentOS 7 running without uh, in a RAM-only mode, right? So does that work when you delegate the DHCP server or only if you use the built-in one? So what we expect on the delegation of DHCP server, so if you're actually wanting to run your own network infrastructure and network IPAM and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. then what we ask is for those, for those nodes that you're wanting Digital Rebar to manage, you would point uh, the next boot server to yeah. our, our system, uh, to the provisioner part of our system. And, and I'll show you that real quick to give you an idea of how digital rebar is actually working. Let's see if this works. I think yeah. We do the same thing. Yeah. So that way, if you have your own DCP server, you can use it. Um, so this is kind of our, what digital rebar services are. Um, and we run a set of kind of data center services. So we're running DNS, NTP, DHCP, our own kind of web server proxy set. Then we have our kind of core DR services, which are a reverse proxy providing kind of single sign-on access and then an API engine, and then database and service registry and logging systems. Mm -hmm. And then we also have our cloud wrap, which is what's managing our, our outbound API to like manage Google and Amazon and OpenStack and um, pack it. Rule Engine does that. We run our own Chef server. Some of our roles are provided by Chef so we can inject our own cookbooks. We could also make that external as well. And then we run a PKI service to handle the ability to generate signed certificates um, within the infrastructure, but it's also exposed so that it can be used to create certificates for workloads if they wanted as well. Um, and they create separate root domains for this, the environment. So, and then, go ahead. What's the decision point where you decide whether to do a local disk boot or a pixie boot? So what happens is, as part of the workflow, the um, system, when it's discovered, shows up and gets these basic roles. Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's sitting in what is called, the node is marked with a boot environment. So if I go look at this node, it's now in local. So what happens is, um, on discovery, hey, hey. put in a sledgehammer. Sorry. Greg, uh, oh, sorry, I was probably behind. 
Sorry, I, my screen hadn't updated. I was just making sure you knew. But you're fine. It was me. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so what happens is the discovery image is that once you apply a set of roles, specifically the rebar installed node role, it will change the boot environment to whatever the install image is. Right. That then goes through, installs the image. When that completes, the last step of the kickstart file sets it to boot local. But you could chain those together if you needed to. For example, if you wanted to do a burn-in test sequence, right? You could do discovery, then switch that to a burn-in sequence, and then switch that to an install sequence, and then switch that to next sequence. Um, so that's kind of how the back-end provisioning pieces are. Once an OS is installed and uh, SSH keys are in place, the system then kind of normalizes itself to kind of cloud-based operations or style where it's then kind of doing all the rest of the stuff through either like Ansible or Chef or whatever. And that's applicable but across both like the cloud instances as well as the physical instances. Okay. Um, any other questions? My Amazon fully making progress. I've got a quick one. Um, how coupled are you guys to cargo? So for example, let's say cargo gets a new feature. Like do you guys bundle your own cargo or... So uh, um, it's actually configurable through metadata. Um, so right now we do a, um, a kind of an intermediate repo, which is basically just exact. There's no difference between them other than just to represent a stabilization point. Cargo is in the process of defining what their release cadence is going to be. And so um, we'll probably reference the release cadence once that gets more set. The goal is to use the upstreams where possible. Um, in some cases, like for the OpenStack Helm stuff that we've been playing with, we have a, a repo that has one more fix in it. We're working on getting that upstreamed. Once that's there, then we'll switch back over to the mainstream. Right? But it's configurable through some of the metadata of the roles themselves. So, so the, the point I would make is there's, there's two things. One is we're, we're really are just using the Ansible, right? We drive Ansible. It's, it's pretty straightforward from that perspective. We want to be using Cargo, so we're not, we're not you know, we get the benefit of the community and we can contribute back to the community. Uh, you could, and we talked about this at a cluster ops meeting, you, know, you could use what we're doing and stage uh, COPS if people wanted. You could stage Kube Admin. Um, the, the work we're doing, right, Digital Rebar is really a ready-stating platform, so it's designed to get infrastructure up into a certain set and create a deployment, which is a scope boundary, and take actions against that set of machines, and then use tools that already exist, right? We don't want to create unique uh, deployment stuff, right? You conceivably could drive Juju also with this. Um, it's, it's, it's designed to stage and then launch. Um, and then once it's done, we're aware of it, and then we can actually take actions. The OpenStack stuff actually drives Helm, and then does the OpenStack deploy on top of the Kubernetes deploy, so we know when the, the deploy is finished. So you can chain uh, different operational models together and mix and match them. Oh, Greg, you were going to show where the... I'll let you yeah, go. so basically we define some metadata of where cookbooks or playbooks or whatever sources you want to use come from. And so in this case, it's using my repo branch, but um, that's just following cargo exactly right now. Um, so there's no difference between the two right now. Uh, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you generate your Ansible in inventory? So our inventory is built based upon metadata. And so in some regards, um, it can be empty, it can be full, in some regards, um, we have two levels to, to deal with that in our inventory. This section here of our definition. So like this is defining a role in, in this view. And in fact, this one is the Kubernetes master role, for example. And so right now what we're doing, and we're going to switch this to even use more of the upstream parts. The point is there's a lot of flexibility. So if you wanted to build your own Ansible playbooks and run them against normal or just your deployed systems, you can do it. Um, in this case, we use um, some maps to say what should things become. 
So this group map here takes uh, digital rebar uh, roles. So if it's a K it's worker, then it's going to get these inventory groups inside of the inventory file. Um, that's how that gets read. And then and we also, we've, we right now are running each role independently um, in cargo. And that was an attempt to allow you to get more visibility into the sequencing of what was going on. But I think we're going to start changing that to be more, more conducive to upstream and just use the cluster files provided by the upstream. Um, and so right now what's happening is we're saying on, on things that are listed as Kate's master run this set of roles from within the um, inside of the uh, Ansible playbook. Um, and then we're going to inject attributes. So for example, these are global attributes that get injected. So we're going to inject the HTTP proxy and some other stuff. And then we even do per node injections so that we can do things like the access IP should be the thing listed as the K8 master network, take the private address and use that for that value, inject for the node and IP that this is the private. So in this case, we're forcing it to be all internal to look internal, but you could tweak these such that you could do things like use cargo to deploy nodes across Amazon and Google by providing the public IPs as the access IPs and the internal IPs to be the private IPs. You could tweak those kind of things if you want to. Right? Okay, one more, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, how you, you have to contribute, in cargo you have to control more options. Um, are you using an external variable file or are you modifying the group bars? So we inject them on top of the group bars. So we have this thing called attributes and we define the attributes that we want to expose. And we've done almost all of the ones in the group bar file are available through this path so that you can then set them on a per deployment basis. So if I go look at, um, for example, one of the, or the deploy files, I can look at Kate's config, for example. And this is all of the attributes that are current, well, a subset of the attributes that are exposed that could be tweaked, right? Some of them you don't want to tweak, some of them you do. But you could change these, and then it would rerun all the playbooks that were associated with these um, variables. And that okay. way, so you can... <laughs> You can do an unsafe upgrade, for example, right now, just by going and changing like Docker 12 to Docker 1, you know, 1.13, right? And that will go forcibly reset it, right? I know in the case of Cargo, they've added an additional um, playbook file, cluster file, that handles upgrade more gracefully. And so one of the things that um, is on my to-do list is to add a deploy and an upgrade that calls both of those um, based upon what the, the user chooses to set in its sequence, right? So you might set it up with the create one and then apply it with the, um, and then update with the update one, right? That way it's much more matches what's currently going on in the cargo community, right? And, and these attributes are, are scoped based on a deployment. So you can have one deployment with one set of attributes and then the next, next deployment with the next set of attributes. Um, and they can come from multiple, they, can, they cascade downwards. So if you have attributes from the hardware that's discovered or you want to set it, um, then you can basically stack things together or retrieve information from a deployment after it's done. It becomes an attribute and then you know what depends on what. So one of the things that for us was really important uh, is that when you take an action from a role, if the role generates data, you have a way to create, that you build an attribute from actual data, discovered information, and then feed that downstream. Um, and then if it changes, it's going to basically trigger a cascade of, oh, you needed this information, that information changed, and you know who's consuming it because the system uh, actually has a graph and it's tightly uh, the, the attributes are tightly coupled. And the other, the other thing we provide is each role within digital rebar has its own um, log, log tracking, so you can see what goes wrong. And since deployment is built as a, as a graph, the idea is that the graph is sequenced and if something has an error, that will turn red. The process will pause for that deployment or that node 
and uh, remediation can be done and then as appropriate the role can be retried and process can continue the idea is to fail fast and give feedback but Let's go back in store for this UI so um, we use a Postgres database um, that serves through a rails app though most of the system is current is um, provided as separate uh, container services that are currently go routines the ghost programs the the main core API rail system is is the last part that we're converting over to go um, and all of this is um, visible and available through um, GitHub slash digital rebar uh, slash digital rebar. So you can look at it there too and find us there. Um, I think I've been babbling for about 30 minutes. So if there's <laughs> questions, more questions, that's fine. But I know there was another agenda item. So I'll kind of stop as well. Yeah, if you guys would just go back through the notes and make sure that you have URLs for the stuff that you want and maybe okay. um, we're going to experiment with putting the notes in the actual YouTube video descriptions so that we can find things months from now. So if there's anything that you want to correct or expand acronyms or any of that stuff. Um, feel free to change anything that I missed. I'm <laughs> sure I missed a lot. Good job so I've, far. I, I babbled a lot. But, oh, his, his notes are great. Wow. Okay, great, great demo. Thanks, guys. Uh, all right, next we have Federation State on premise, Matty Mo. Oh, that's that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, there's no people shouting in the background right now. Um, no, there are. So, um, I was wondering if any of the members uh, present uh, are aware of the state of Federation on premise. Uh, well, the main problem is. Uh, it requires a cloud provider to work because it relies on uh, external IP controlling for uh, the Federation um, API server. It's supposed to listen to an external IP uh, and then it's supposed to connect to a DNS, a cloud DNS service, either Google GCE, GKE, or AWS. Um, there's some experimental support that was added for core DNS, but it's not documented. Um, so this is something that really needs some attention. Um, doc, uh, CubeFed needs to be updated to support it, uh, but it's not actually uh, in the syntax anywhere yet. But there is a provider there. Um, and then the other option the issue is, uh, should we use NodePort? Should we consider uh, Marantis's external IP provider, uh, controller, sorry? or some other option for um, deploying, controlling um, the uh, Federation API server. Um, so this item is just uh, bringing it to the attention of the SIG, um, looking for more feedback uh, wherever I can. Yeah, so I think the question is, uh, you know, how you guys are actually solving this problem now? I mean, there, there might be some workarounds or, you know, some other ways to, to do that or, because I don't believe that no one is running Federation on on, on premise, <laughs> I hope. So, so how do you guys solve this? To be honest, we haven't even looked at it yet for us. Yeah, Rob and, and Greg, so you guys have support for hybrid, right? So uh, how, how it's solved with this digital rebar uh, solution? The, the IP issue? Well, considering two clusters, yeah. Yeah, we haven't tackled that either. Um, we've been mostly waiting to see what shows up with regard to like some of the Ubernetes work, but Right. Not sure. Um, we did some toy playing with things like using um, cargo, for example, or the when we were using stuff before cargo to do cross 
uh, cluster stuff. But in some regards, with regard to networking, that's just kind of abysmal, and we're not sure why anybody would necessarily want to do that. Just um, other than just to show it could be done. Um, you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of it, right? It was like, yeah. don't don't do it that way. Um, no, let, let me with, with with what we're doing with setting up two clusters in parallel, it would be possible to pull that data and then create a Ubernetes um, piece. We we just haven't done it yet. Be an interest, very interesting use case. Okay, uh, let me illustrate the most uh, prime example of why you would want uh, public private um, federation. One is you have your 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 physical servers, you paid for all of them, so you deploy as much as you can, all the resources you can locally, and then once you've reached your limit, you start provisioning um, pods and whatever on your um, your cloud vendor uh, on demand, and those cost money, you know, when you're using them, and then when your demand drops, you, you know, get rid of them eventually. That's much more difficult, but you can still do it. Um, so, uh, you want them separate because you don't want a very high latency between your kubelets and your API servers, um, because and especially your your CNI, there's there's no need for them to to be close uh, if you have, um, you know how to say some sort of routing and external IP controlling, so you can uh, do ingress between the two clusters. Right. Use case makes sense. Yeah. It just doesn't work yet, um, unless you point your on-prem to Google and your Google one to Google. Yes, yeah, so it looks looks like uh, it's a uh, uh, quite a quite a problem now, right? So, so I think that might be a good candidate to start working on actually uh, to, uh, from from SIG on-prem perspective. So it looks like we have probably. We need some more time <laughs> to think about it. Uh, so maybe for the um, for the next meeting, we'll try to gather some some existing solutions uh, solutions out there. Uh, maybe talk to federation guys. Uh, what are their their plans, and we can figure out how we can help them actually uh, with this. Yeah, I would I would do that. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to scour through their last notes to see if they're mentioning any on-prem stuff at all. I'm kind of hoping. Anything they mention will have formed or something. So anything they mention will have core DNS in it. All right. So, well. Looks like we don't have more input here, so I think we can close this this item from the agenda and maybe continue uh, in two weeks. I try to get some more information and coordinate with uh, SIG uh, Federation. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, do we know who offhand who's demoing next week, or any any ideas for agendas for I'm sorry for two weeks from now for the next meeting? I don't remember, but I can check uh, okay. email thread. I thought I thought it was me this week, so maybe it's me in two weeks. Oh, well, might be, yeah. I think I, I'm listed after the rock end. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, nowhere yeah. near as pretty. Okay, well, we'll just we can follow right. up with that on the on yeah. the list. Okay. okay. Item kept. I, I always lose track of it. <laughs> the the list. Well, whenever whenever there's free time, uh, I can demo Chorus Tectonic if people want it. Yeah, let's let's check the the, the email thread. Uh, I also don't remember what was the, the agreement. Yeah, so I don't. Will just I'm pretty sure we got everyone, everyone on the list. It's just the order that we don't have on. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> cool. Okay, with that, any other last minute items? Going once, twice. Chat sold. Okay, see everyone in two weeks, and we'll get the video and notes posted out as soon as possible. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a good day. Good day. Thanks, Robin. Right. Thank you. Great, great notes. Yeah, that was awesome.
trying to add some graphics for it. I uh, appreciate the feedback, everybody. If you have questions, hang us.